I'll go ahead. So my, uh, again, my name is Daryl DeGamo. I am a development manager with uh, Windmill Developments. I've been with Windmill for the last two years. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, I, uh, I have uh, over 15 years of experience as an architect and have worked and as a consultant in the architectural field for some time. Uh, in the last, I would say, four years or so of my working in the consulting field, I had the opportunity of working in Revit and some BIM technologies and have uh, dabbled with it a little bit, but I'm going to say straight out that I am by no means a, uh, a guru in, uh, in Revit or in BIM by any means. Uh, but what I would like to do is just share with you guys sort of the experiences that we've had as a development company over the last two years and how I've really seen some, some shifts and some changes in the way that we're working, particularly over at Windmill. I'll try that. I'm left-handed, so of course that's going to... Uh, there we go. Windmill Developments differentiates itself from other developers in the sense that we have a triple bottom line that we feel very firmly about. It's something that we continue to work through the process from beginning to end in the development and, uh, and with everyone that we work with on this development. Uh, it's not very complicated. People, planet, and profits, and we've put them in that particular order because that's the, that's the order which is important to us. There's no question that uh, when you're developing something that is sustainable, like a development like Zibi, uh, we've got something that is 37 acres. We hope to be one of the most sustainable developments in the world if this succeeds. And we've, got, we've also got the One Planet endorsement, which is something that we're working with. The similarities between the two where Windmill has, has always worked in the past with, with, with the, three, the, the, bottom, the triple bottom line is we've always worked with lead buildings and we've always tried to achieve lead platinum. Uh, the people portion of it is something that is very visible. When you see windmill projects, we always try to incorporate some sort of a social component into a lot of our developments, into our buildings. The planet is something that we firmly believe in from sustainability and trying to push it to the extreme. And then the profit is obviously something that we are in business to make money and we don't hide that. The one planet is where it becomes very interesting. So on this particular development, uh, the one planet endorsement has just thrown it, to, thrown it through another level entirely. And uh, there are 10 components to the one planet. It is something that has not been achieved yet in Canada and is something that we're hoping that we will achieve by the time that we are done this development. It is development wide, it is not building specific. And again, it really does fall back to the people, the planet, and a portion of it falls to profit. The people portion of it is the one that I want to focus on the most because it is the one that Windmill has a tendency to want to try and work in through the development. It's not, and it's not an end product. So when we go for lead, generally we see it as a checklist and an end product to a building or the triple bottom line, did we succeed at the end or even the endorsement at the end and whether or not we get one planet. This is something that we try and weave through the development from beginning to end. And I think that's what I'm going to try and convey to you as we kind of go through this to show you how important it is to us on a certain level to make sure that we are continuously working with people and collaborating with people. And that's what makes us, I think, a little bit more innovative than other developers in achieving the goals that we want with regards to sustainability. Here's a good example of one of the things that, so this over the last two years, we had the opportunity of working with the Sims Lab and Steve Fies Group. What's been truly amazing to me about this process, and we, we kind of all knew this going in, and Windmill already knew that there was a potential here to be able to scan or go through the site and survey the entire site probably more rapidly than what we've been used to before. And now, you know, I don't think Steve and I have ever had this conversation, but there are other people out there doing this, and you guys may know these people. We had an opportunity to work with Carleton University, which was something that was really important to us. One, because they're local. Uh, two, because we're building relationships with universities and academia in the region, which is something that was also important to Windmill. Um, you know, the positive side is Steve gets to bring this to the table. He gets to bring students to work on the projects. There is real life experience in taking real life projects and in return, Windmill gets something that I found was truly remarkable with our project. The challenge with our project, I mean, th this is a good example of what you see here is, is the scan on the left side is essentially looking at one of the buildings that we've got, which is Block 25, which is made up of three buildings over 100 years. They've just piled on buildings, and that's what industrial buildings are. And on the right side, we've converted it into a model. So 
seems fairly straightforward, and I know a lot went into it, but this is what we had to work with. And I mean, this is actually a good drawing compared to the pile that we were given. We had some hand sketches that were very, very difficult to make sense of. And we had a series of drawings that would have been fairly complicated. And the drawings are, dra are, are drawn in a sense, and I think we all recognize this, they're drawn in the sense that they're probably the ideal situation, but it's not the as-built in this particular case. And as I was describing, these buildings are industrial buildings. They are built on over years, and they are a series of just hodgepodge pieces put together, sometimes not standardized at all. The grid patterns don't necessarily make sense, and, and Steve can probably talk more about that at some point. The columns aren't all the same size, and buildings just connect and they all come together. We had to try and make sense of what are we keeping, what are we not keeping, uh, how are we going to work with these buildings? Are they structurally sound? And by actually scanning the buildings and working with Steve's group, this is that same building which you guys might recognize. If you go up on Eddy Street, on the west side of Eddy Street, there is this what we call the memory frame. It's not a structural term. It is a, a remembering of what that building used to look like with the steel structure on top. Now that building is made up again of three buildings. So this, this is just one scan showing you essentially that section through, I think this is building number eight, and is showing you the basement level. There were moments as we got the information back that we were working with our architects and Steve is working with our architects where we found that there were voids in the building and things weren't adding up. If you remember on the previous drawing, they showed the terrain below ground and it was probably drawn, drawn in such a manner that made a little bit more sense at the time. But over time, this, is tra this has changed dramatically. Uh, these buildings are, are old mills. They've got water flowing through them. You've got 100 years of erosion underneath, which in some cases have actually wiped out the columns, not quite touching the foundation. You've got areas where soil has been eroded entirely. And then we've got voids underneath the buildings that make up about three levels worth of in Indiana Jones type environments of walking over planks that you can't quite get to or you can never survey. It would have taken us years and we probably would have gone back consistently to keep measuring to make sure that things are working or where they should be. This was a fantastic way of us to be able to immediately recognize if we feel we're missing space, whether or not we've actually captured everything that's there and to assess quite quickly whether or not we're holding on to the buildings because from a sustainable level this was something that was very important to windmill it was part of the character of this site also allows us to walk away with a model that we can implement site-wide as we're doing all our new buildings as well uh, we would never have had that otherwise and so we found that to be truly useful again the value there is the ability to be able to work with an organization like Steve's where uh, we're able to give opportunities to students to work with Windmill. It gives us truly the pleasure to be able to get that information back from, from them to be able to work and go forward. So this is one where I'm not sure whether or not there's any students in the room, but Richard will probably recognize this. Windmill also has a, uh, has a, a, a standing relationship with Algonquin College. We continue to work with different faculties on our site for the Zibi project. We continue to have exchanges with them, either uh, them coming to site and working on very specific projects or us attending CRITS on many cases. Now this is a project where, uh, as you can see, it's a research project regarding the building envelope. We have two buildings which we refer to as block two and three. Again, turn of the century buildings, brick, um, have, a, have a, a very special appeal to them because they are industrial buildings. The challenge we have with these buildings and trying to be sustainable is how do we stop these buildings from leaking like a sieve so that we can actually keep all the energy inside it and everything that we generate and be as efficient as possible. It is extremely challenging. So one of the things that we gave to this particular group at Algonquin was to look at the building envelope and see what they could actually come up with. What I really like about working with students at this level, specifically with Algonquin, well, one, Algonquin students are coming in and they work for free. So and then the, uh, the, the fact that they come to the table and they're not taking necessarily the full economic impact into consideration, their minds are a little bit more free and open to different possibilities, which is what we need with regards to people coming to the table and coming up with ideas. These are two buildings that are side by side with a laneway in between, and you may know them already, 
that, uh, that are challenged because the building envelope is, is, is horrible. But we've, we're trying to come up with a way that we can actually make this work. Well, I know this group came to the table at one point and, and said something extremely obvious, which is, well, we can at least take care of two of the facades if we put a canopy over those buildings and we connect them. And it's something that we probably would never have really pursued or considered at one point, but when you know the impact on a sustainable level and you know how much you can save in terms of energy, you can then factor that cost into whether or not that canopy and enclosing it makes total sense. And those are the things that BIM and this type of technology allow us to look at, and quite quickly. So this is what we're actually really enjoying about working at that level with the academics. Now this is something that you probably all recognize a little bit more. We're working with our construction manager. Windmill has a relationship right now with the construction manager on the Zibi project, which is LEDCOR. It's also made up of a, uh, of a conglomerate between LEDCOR and Brunei. It is called the Eddie Lands Construction Company. LEDCOR has a, quite a far reach when it comes to BIM. At least my experience at this point has been quite positive. What you see here is a, is a general quantity takeoff. I think a lot of you have probably seen this before. Very useful when the developer is sitting down with his construction manager trying to figure out where the costs are going. And when you see something like this that is color coded, makes it very, very clear, it is an easy communication tool. And that is one of the things that we're finding with regards to Revit and to BIM right now is that we're finding it really useful to communicate internally some of the information that we've been saying. So having a bunch of numbers in front of us combined with something like this puts the two together and makes it very, very clear to everyone. So at our level, it is something that we appreciate tremendously. Where I felt that things were actually getting quite interested, and I'm sure some of you have seen this type of work as well, is we've got 22 acres on the Quebec side, which is made up primarily of rock. And this is what used to be the old Philemon Wright Island. Now that 22 acres has got to have infrastructure in it. Uh, LEDCOR worked very hard on laying out our infrastructure on the site, took the survey, combined with our geotechnical information to find out where our rock levels were, all to figure out this is how much rock you need to take out of this site. What's been interesting is that you pick your highest point, your lowest point, and then you start to work at whether or not, well, what if that lowest point was the one standalone building, but the next one was considerably higher? What if we leave that building and we pump up and we, how much further can we raise the infrastructure at this point and how much are we saving? And that becomes pretty critical to us because it is something that is done fairly quickly. And the type of model that you see here was something that they were able to adjust quite rapidly. So when we asked them, what if we were to raise it three feet and we were to pump that last building instead of actually drawing all, all our systems down to all, to, from one extreme to the other, um, we knew immediately what, what the, the value was. The other part of this is out of the 22 acres, we have half of that, we'll say 10 acres, which is probably just reserved for future phases. Now, based on the construction schedule that we've got and based on the amount and quantity of rock that we're taking out, we know how much we can actually store on site or how much of it needs to come off. And based on the time of the year, we know whether or not half loads or full loads are something that we can actually factor in cost-wise. So the quantity in the rock was easily calculated and we knew exactly how much could be stored on site. And again, quick numbers for us. It was something that was very easy to understand. Now that is at a very, I mean, this is at a, this is at a development level with your construction manager and it, it, it's very cost involved. But the, the next example that I really want to bring to the table is, is this one, is our due diligence with, uh, with authorities. And what it comes down to is we've got a hydro line, and you may know the site already. We have a hydro line that runs from the Cougar plant, and it runs all the way to the hydro dam, which is on the west side of the site. It runs right through our site. Kruger is using that power right now. It continues to be a live hydro line. We have a building, as you can see, that once we calculated, once we modeled it, our fifth and sixth floor are about three feet away from that hydro line. It's high power. This is, this is not something that we could mess around with. So there was an immediate need to want to take that hydropower down, to get it out of the site. We needed it to, to be down this year, in 2016. The challenge we have uh, on this site, just like uh, a lot of the other parts are, that we're working with several authorities here. So we've got the city of Gatineau, 
Uh, well, I'll back up. We're working with Kruger directly because this is their power. So they are a processing plant. We cannot shut them down at any point. We have to find when their downtime is and then we have to work with that. The other part of it is if they're going to take that hydro line down and redirect it somewhere, Quebec Hydro is going to redirect it for them. So they're also in the pool. And then on top of that, we've got the city of Gatineau because you'll be tearing up their streets and coordinating their transportation route, which is a major transportation route on the Quebec side, and how that all comes together. LEDCOR gave us the ability to be able to want to demonstrate the urgency and how important it was for us to tape that line down. One, because we can work, probably work around it on the first building, which is O. Uh, the second building, that, that tower is right smack in the middle of our foundation, and there's no way that we can get out of the ground if we have that there. We're able to bring this to City of Gatineau, we we're able to bring it to Kruger, and we we're able to bring it to, um, to Hydro-Quebec and demonstrate how important it was. Luckily for us, uh, the city of Gatineau had a, had a card in their back pocket, and that was that for 2017, no one is digging up streets in Gatineau because of our, our celebrations for 2017. Uh, so that put a lot of pressure on everyone. But this was a critical tool to help us make them understand what what was needed from our end. So again, it comes back to that, that, that level of communication. And I don't think it's any surprise to any of you. I mean, when I go back and talk about the, the experience that I had as an architect and working with Revit, the, it, was, it was really focused primarily on how much, I, how much time I could save. Uh, it was primarily focused on how much I could communicate at the time to the client directly. Uh, but it was, very much, it was very much oriented on whether or not it could help us as a firm proceed and go further and be a little bit more innovative and maybe getting a little bit of an edge over other over companies. The way we've been working in the last two years has been far more collaborative than I think I've ever worked. And I realize to what extent it is important to work with some of these people that have probably more advanced technologies at this point. I thought that we were really truly at the cutting edge at the time, and I'm looking at two coworkers that we were, we were ahead of the curve at the time where we thought that no one else in town might have been working as far or deeply into Revit. We were cut off overnight. You just had to start working in Revit the next day, and away you go. And uh, I now realize that construction managers, um, you know, academia are pushing things so much further. Uh, the construction manager Obviously, there, there are costs associated to their being able to actually work some of these things out ahead of time. As a developer, that is, is, is a very comforting thing to know. Uh, but more than anything, it gives us the tools to be able to communicate even further than that. And these are all the people that we deal with on a regular basis that are not part of the design team. And as a development manager, it has been extremely useful. Anywhere from, from the scans that Steve had provided to some of the reports that we're getting from Algonquin and being able to share that information, uh, all the way to what we're getting from our construction manager. Across the board, it has been an extremely useful uh, tool to communicate. So I'm gonna leave you with, uh, with this, is that uh, I think that I've already indicated to you to what extent that this type of tool and that BIM promotes a, a high level of confidence on all levels of the project. When you can get a team working together as well as I feel that we're working right now, uh, the, the information that's generated is something that, that you immediately take seriously and you can look back at and you can keep passing on and it's done fairly quickly. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go through, I mean essentially, I just wanna indicate that, uh, and I'm gonna read through this because I've kind of been you know, going through most of my presentation, but I'm gonna say that that the use of BIM and collaborations on all levels of a project, whether it's with academia or whether it's with, through consultants or the construction manager, um, windmills achieved a triple bottom line, uh, the people, planet, profit, by developing an unconventional, an unconventional project in an unconventional manner. We are, we are really trying to go after different technologies and we are approached regularly by people with, with, with different technologies. We are a company that are very interested in this because we are trying to achieve that triple bottom line and we know that the only way that we can do it is if we are actually a little bit more innovative than the other people. Primarily because the people portion of it, I think Windmill has a very strong sense of people. Uh, anyone who knows Jeff Westindy and knows the partners understand that it is extremely important to us. 
the sustainability part of it, anyone that knows Windmill and knows the partners also know that we will bike and we will do everything that we can to try and do our part for sustainability. The profit is a challenge at times with this type of development. And this is where I think BIM uh, is very useful in helping us get to a level that is a little bit more competitive than others. And I think that going forward, it really ties together, I think, on a, on a certain level, it ties back the people, uh, the planet, and the profit all very, very well together, and it's a very useful tool. So the only thing I can add to that, and I was just thinking about this on the way here, is that I'm, try I'm, I'm talking about the fact that we are, we are trying to promote this, this sense of collaboration, how well it can work when you've got a tool like, like, like Revit or you've got BIM technology. And I think this is actually, this, this conference is actually a very good example of, of that sense of collaboration, that the, the exchange of information that will happen today are all things that everyone will be able to walk away with, understanding what, what we as a developer is what's important to us. And I think you're going to get a sense from the people that are up here, some of the technologies that are also being sort of pushed forward and where some of that cutting edge is and, and how things are being used today. So I uh, thank you.